Good afternoon. My name is John Strope. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. The brown bags have been offered since the mid-1980s. With a couple of exceptions some years ago, the brown bag topics for a year are not thematic. However, in light of Nebraska's 150th celebration of statehood, the Society will sponsor brown bags for 2017 related to the theme of Peoples of Nebraska. Lectures are held monthly on the third Thursday in the auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum at 15th and P Street in Lincoln. The programs have a live audience, are broadcast on public access channels in Lincoln, Omaha, Bellevue, Hastings, North Platte, Grand Island, Papillion, South Sioux City, Blair, Bassett, Shadron, Sydney, and Beatrice, and are posted on YouTube. A detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all of the Society's programs and services, can be found on the Society's website at history.nebraska.gov. If you are not already a member, I encourage you to join. Benefits of membership include subscriptions to Nebraska History Magazine and to the Society's newsletter. Use of a reader printer in the Society's library archives to make free copies from microfilm. Free admission to the Society's seven historic sites. Discounts in the Society's landmark stores at the History Museum, the State Capitol, and Chimney Rock. And reduced fees for kids' classes, tours, after hours events, and similar activities where there is a fee. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast programs on public access television across the state and on the Society's YouTube page. To find these videos on YouTube, directions for our live audience are on today's handouts for those of you in the audience. For those viewing the video, the directions are on the screen. It's easy. Type in your browser, www.youtube.com slash user slash Nebraska Historical. Click on Playlists and you will go to a new page. There you will see a list labeled 2017, a subsection to house the special sesquicentennial brown bag series Peoples of Nebraska programs. Just below that section, you will see a subsection labeled Brown Bag Lectures, where you will find over 150 past brown bags available on YouTube. Our speaker, sort of, is Kelly Garcia. I say sort of because the real speakers are middle and high schoolers from deep in the heart of the Sand Hills, Mullen, Nebraska and in some cases, they're interviewees. My best research tells me this is the first brown bag in the 30 plus year history of the society of their brown bags to be done predominantly by students. So I call Kelly more of an MC than a speaker. The videos that make up this talk were done while participating in the American History Film Project. The project encourages students in grades K to 12 to be proud of their local history and to submit films of 10 minutes or less. These films are judged on their content, not their production perfection. To learn more about the project, ask Kelly afterwards or check out AmericanHistoryFilmProject.org, AmericanHistoryFilmProject.org on the web. Our topic is Struggles and Survival in the Sand Hills. Kelly Garcia teaches Spanish 1 through 4 and 7th grade world history at, at Mullen Junior Senior High School. She has taught community interest courses for Mid Plains Community College. She has BA and MA, ME degrees in Spanish. She has presented at teacher conferences and at the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. An only child, Kelly grew up in the mountains of Virginia, has been teaching since 1997, lived in, and has lived in Mexico for five years where she taught English. 
Now she lives in America where she teaches Spanish. <laughs> she moved to Mullen, Nebraska in 2010. Just to let you know about asking questions, Kelly prefers waiting until the end. Please join me in welcoming Kelly Garcia. Thank you, John, and everybody. Thanks for coming. Nebraska has a rich, fascinating history. The Nebraska Territory, according to Britannica.com, originally encompassed about 351,558 square miles. By 1863, however, Nebraska was reduced to almost its present size by the organization of the Colorado, Dakota, and Idaho territories. Long before explorers came and fur traders established trading posts in the early 1800s, Nebraska was the territory and hunting grounds of various Native American tribes, such as the Ponca, Pawnee, Cheyenne, Omaha, and even the Lakota. Crazy Horse, born in 1841 or 1842 near the Black Hills, is perhaps one of the most well-known of the Lakota warriors. The US 50 website estimated that there were at least 40,000 Native Americans in Nebraska before the first settlers came. Evidence of indigenous occupation can be found throughout Nebraska, especially in the blowouts on ranches in the Sand Hills. According to the Nebraska Trailblazer number no. seven, in 1854, the population of our great state was only 2,732 people. That figure, of course, totally disregarded the thousands of indigenous people who already inhabited the area. The Homestead Act of 1862 drove thousands of pioneers to the West. Settlers were allowed to claim 160 acres of government land for a $10 fee and occupation of the land for five years. Daniel Freeman was the first on record to take advantage of the opportunity. He filed a claim near the town of Beatrice. Others were not far behind. In the process, Native Americans were herded onto reservations, but some, like Crazy Horse, fought. Based on the information found at encyclopedia.com, he resisted living on a reservation, but he finally led a band of 850 people to Nebraska's Fort Robinson in May of 1877. By September of that same year, Crazy Horse was dead from a bayonet wound. A low-ranking official, William Gentiles, stabbed Crazy Horse. It is still unknown if it was done intentionally. After Nebraska achieved statehood in 1867, the population increased quickly. Growth went from 120,000 to more than a million people by 1890. Based on several conversations with Pat Bridges, I learned that there were not only land allotments, but also tree claims. The Timber Culture Act of 1873 encouraged the planting of trees, but the program was discontinued within 25 years due to fraudulent claims and widespread abuse. Many settlers, like Pat's relatives, had limited access to lumber for building, so they made do with sod houses or dugouts. Lumber usually was brought in by wagon. Building a house required a lot of help, so neighbors came together to help one another. It became a welcome distraction from daily routine as well as a fun social occasion. The very nature of Nebraska made settlement a challenge, but early pioneers were tough and resilient in the face of hardship. Settlers faced drought, plagues of grasshoppers, and blizzards, but they didn't give up. That's why we are here celebrating today. Hi, my name is Lindy. And I'm Hannah. We're here to talk about Nebraska history. We realize we both like arrowheads because my great uncle and my great granddad have collections of them. Here are some fun facts about arrowheads. Arrowheads normally have smaller points and larger points are called spearheads. Number two, they are made out of flint and stone. Number three, arrowheads were used as weapons and tools. Number four, only three of many Indian tribes in Nebraska are Comanche, Arapaho, and Cheyenne. Number five, we find them today because they were lost or broken. Number six, you find arrowheads in blowouts, riverbeds, plowed fields, and construction sites. My granddad told me that, that he found most of his arrowheads in blowouts in the sand hills when he was in his 40s. My uncle has found most of his arrowheads on the ranch I live now. 
He also has got some from auction. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something about arrowheads. Hi, I'm Ty. And I'm Tevin. Today we're going to teach you how to make a mud brick house. Oh God! First, what you want to do is get some nice sticky soil so you don't have to add any water. Then you're going to want to add some straw to the, to the soil so it'll stay compact. And then you're going to mix it together. Once you're done mixing, you're going to want to take some molds pack the dirt into them. As you can see, we've already made some. Once you are done packing them, carefully remove. together to heal them together. Then just keep building it. Just keep putting your molds on and building it until you get it your house the size you want it. We're not going to build a major ha size house because that would take more than the time we have. What you're going to want to do is smash them together so no rain and snow or any of the weather gets in. You won't have a very good house if all the rain gets in.
we got our dirt out of a the uh, dried up pond. It was still kind of wet, so we didn't have to add any water. But you may need to add some water if if your bricks are not sticking together. make your molds out of anything. It doesn't have to be nice wood. It can be any, like a log or anything. Just so it's the size of brick you want it. Well, the house is not yet done, and as I'm sure some of you noticed, um, Ty and Tevin were making more of an adobe brick rather than the sod. You know, they weren't cutting blocks of sod out, but they chose the windiest day of the year to do it, and I would have not wanted to do the laundry when they were finished. Okay, Lexi's idea, her film idea came from a newspaper article that her grandmother had saved about a murder investigation in Hooker County and the involvement of the FBI. Frank Harding is a very knowledgeable, active member of the Hooker County Historical Society. The building where the murder supposedly happened still stands in Mullen. Go ahead. Okay. So I came up with some questions to ask you. Um, my first one is, I'm pretty sure this wasn't the first crime, so why do you think the FBI started on this crime? on this particular crime. Mm -hmm. When this murder thing that you have, this Hamilton came in, and what he did, was doing was, was uh, spotting places out in the middle of these big ranches that they, nobody owned the land, so he'd find a homesteader and bring them in and show them where to go. And so the local people that had been here a while didn't like that really well. So Roosevelt <coughs> thought that uh, this is, and this Hamilton was reporting them to the government. He'd go and find and report that this land was available for homesteading and whatnot. And all at once Hamilton disappeared. Nobody knew what happened to him. So that's when he sent an investigator in here to try to find out what happened to him. And of course what really happened is Hamilton got in trouble with this saloon. The uh, saloons were illegal in Mullen. We would drive it. They had an illegal saloon here and Hamilton was going to report him to the authorities yeah. and get him closed down. And McBride was, uh, that owned the saloon, kind of thought the report was that he offered a thousand dollars to anybody that would kill him. Well, they didn't know they did, but anyway, if you read the story of the murder, that is what happened. They went in there and they did kill a guy and all that stuff. But uh, <coughs> the investigator that uh, Roosevelt had in here, when he got to visit with Clevenger and they found this was killed, they assumed that the UBI cattle company, because these guys were employees of them, had it done. And so that's, uh, he said it in there and they just started in 1980, formed this, and they called it the Bureau of Investigation, and then later it got named Federal Bureau of Investigation, but that's how they, how they got started uh, in here, because they were trying to enforce the homestead law. And it had nothing really to do with the murder except they thought this guy was killed by local ranchers to keep from getting homestead. My name is Kylie Licking and I'm doing a presentation on irrigated pivot systems. Nebraska is both the nation's largest producer and user of center pivot irrigation. In 1947, Frank Zybeck of Columbus, Nebraska developed a prototype center pivot irrigation machine. 
He did this by modifying and refining the design to improve operational efficiency. Zybeck made it sturdier, taller, and more reliable. Zybeck made it from a hydraulic power system to an electrical drive system. He had lots of hurdles to overcome, like the first five tower system on wheels that ran two to three feet off the ground and could irrigate 40 acres that was launched in 1949. He then continued to work on this system and filed for a patent in 1952 to protect his invention. In 1954, Frank Zybeck teamed up with Robert Daughtery of Bally Manufacturing and from there built pivots into the most significant mechanical innovation in agriculture since the replacement of draft animals with tractors. With Nebraska sitting on top of the Ogallala Aquifer, it provides enough to supply the irrigated acres. As of 2007, Nebraska has more than 100,000 irrigated wells and there are roughly 8.56 million acres irrigated. Off camera, Pat shared with us that her aunt had inherited the ranch many years ago, the Double R Guest Ranch. When she was ready to pass it on to the next generation, she spoke with Pat's sisters who gave the impression that nobody was interested in taking the reins. That wasn't true, but it was too late. It was already slated to be sold. So Pat gathered as much money from as many sources as possible to buy the property. Near the end of the video, you will see what some of the property looks like now. Hi, I'm Kelly Garcia, and we're visiting here today with Pat Bridges, owner and operator of a guest ranch and a cattle ranch that's presently leased, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the sod house that we will see later. Pat? Well, the sod house over there uh, was built in 1908 by my grandparents, who came here from Missouri, and um, they, they um, had the neighbors collect and help build that sod house and they, they came in April and the sod house was done for Christmas so they really worked but it's a big sod house. Yes. <laughs> but anyway the neighbors were all so pleased to have them come because my grandfather was a doctor and of course they had no doctors out here and so all the people were so excited that they would have a doctor available to take care of their children and so forth and um, so anyway the the, over at the sod house, there's another house that you will see on the video probably. It's where they lived. That was the first one that was put up. And until they got that put up, they lived with the, um, people down in the other valley who had offered to let them stay in their basement until they got their house put up. The little one. The little one. Yeah. And so they stayed in the little house, and there was my grandmother, my great grandmother, and my uncle, my great uncle, and my great grandfather, my grandfather. And uh, my great grandfather was my friend. And um, my mom, who was two, and my aunt, who was four months old. Mm -hmm. four months. And so uh, that was a, quite a spectacular trip for my grandmother. <laughs> I bet it was. <laughs> but she had her own doctor, so, you know, that would, that would eliminate some of the worry That's of true. bringing a new baby out mm -hmm. from, from that far off. But anyway, um, on their trip, out from Mullen, they came on a dray wagon that they had brought all their lumber that they were going to use to build their their barn and their house and so forth with them on the train. And they had uh, uh, quite a bit of stuff to bring. They, they stored that in Mullen, and then they went to the hotel and then they got a dray wagon 
and hired and it took them I don't know how long it took them a long time to get out from mall and clear out to here because where they stayed was on the other side of this place mm -hmm. a mile and a half or three miles about over to where the other place was and um, on the way out from Mullen, they had um, they had a forest fire to go through that across the road, mm -hmm. and uh, they were they were loaded, of course, with whatever they had. They had to bring stuff with them to save another trip, you know. And so they they had a lot of stuff on the, on the wagon, it was a dray wagon, and they had all that. And then um, it rained. Put out the forest fire. Of course, they're all traveling down the road all this time. And then they ran into a snowstorm, oh. uh, a blizzard. In it was it was in April, it was the spring mm -hmm. blizzard. And they ran into that. And uh, by the time they got to the, I don't, I think the name was Morrison. I'm not sure what it was. But anyway, when, by the time they got to those people's house, well, they were more than ready to be there. <laughs> <laughs> they were. <laughs> and they, of course, my grandma hadn't met them, but my grandfather had. Mm -hmm. He came out to scout the place uh, in September with the, the choir there. And then they had to wait until the baby was born before they could move. So, we have to let her have just a short time, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> before they had to leave. And then they came out. That's, it. Well, that's a really neat story. And I'm sure that song has like so many memories for you guys. Mm -hmm. It does have. Nebraska, a lightly populated agricultural state. In the past hundred years, Nebraska has changed very little. Thousands of years ago, Nebraska was covered by glaciers. These glaciers formed the rolling hills that are here today.
Once, Nebraska is home to many bison. Today, Nebraska raises many cattle on its wild grasses. Archaeological research shows that Nebraska has been inhabited for at least 12,000 years. It is clear that through many centuries, different groups have inhabited the area. The rubble shown here is possibly rubble of an old general store. As you can see, there are some bits of sandstone foundation. This general store probably supported the others' homesteads, which you will see that lived around it. Here are some artifacts I found while I filmed this homestead. What you see now is the top to a medicine bottle or possibly an alcohol bottle. We found this around the stone rubble, which we believe might have been a table. This is coal. We now know that whoever lived here burnt coal for heat or to cook. Here is some burnt glass. This leads us to believe that there is possibly a lightning strike or fire here. Here is a brick and sandstone foundation of what was possibly a family house. I know what you're thinking. Wow, this looks small. The reason this is so small is because it was far traveling for them to find the materials to build a house. The reason we have to believe that this was left during the Dust Bowl is because there is a cast iron stove left inside and also many glass objects and pottery pieces scattered around suggesting that they were forced to leave. The way this was put together suggests that they built the stone flat on the ground, then forced it up and held it together using some type of sandstone glue. If you look closely, you can see some metal parts. These are parts of a leftover cast iron stove, which was used for cooking and heating. This may be one of my favorite pieces found. This may have been the top to a perfume bottle or possibly a wine or whiskey bottle. Here are a couple of nails. The bottom, and the smallest nail, was used for driving horseshoes into horse's feet. This is the bottom of a bottle I found. I found this very interesting because the markings on the bottle tell that it was made in Atta, Oklahoma, and it was made by Hazel Atlas Glass Company, which lets me know that it was made during the early 1900s. This is some sandstone rubble of what was the general store. 
Although there is no artifacts, this is cool because it is the oldest. Here are my sources. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. My name is Crazy Horse. I have had visions. Visions that I cannot die in battle. Nor have I yet. I may have lost one. Therefore, I'm giving myself up to the reservation. I thought I'd never do it, but I did. Only because they promised me they would treat me well, but as they had treated, or they had promised other Indians, they were treated very poorly. So I'm leaving the reservation. I hope not to die in battle. Now, I've been hunting crazy horse for a while. He got away from me at the creek, so I followed him with his tree. Now, crazy horse is a great warrior, but I, a soldier, nothing can stop me. Now dead. September 5th, 1877. What a shame. Of 1948 in the Great Plains of Nebraska. The weather was calm and spirits were high, as a warm fall produced exceptionally bountiful harvests of wheat, corn, and soybeans to be sold. Everything seemed to be looking up, and with new technologies and better transportation methods, farmers and ranchers only had positive changes to look forward to in the future. There was no arguing that they were having luck, but by mid-November, that luck began to run out. Nebraska has always been known for its severe winters, but nothing could prepare its residents for the harshness of the 1948 and 1949 blizzards. A Nebraska poet recalls the snow-filled winters of the Great Plains. Great Plains in winter. Blue snow in the moonlight, set back from the road, a house with a single lamp-lit window. The whole world holds its breath. 
The whole world, or the Great Plains at least, was indeed holding its breath as the first storm rolled in on November 18th, carrying heavy snow, sleet, and winds up to 50 and 70 miles per hour. Roads were blocked, schools were closed, snow drifted over rooftops, and livestock were stranded. Unfortunate travelers that happened to be on the road when the storm hit filled hotels to overflowing, while many others were trapped in their cars. Trains were stuck, and telephone service was disrupted, making communication impossible. In fact, after the storm, the phone company reported more than 5,000 wire breaks and 1,700 downed telephone poles. Reports of snowfall up to 24 inches were reported around the Harrington and Bloomfield areas. The Weather Bureau went as far as to call the storm one of the most severe blizzards on record over much of the central and northeastern portions of the state. Holly Miller recalls having to venture out into the storm to rescue people who were stranded between York and Waco, Nebraska. <clears throat> and then, of course, we had one, one bad one in 1948, too, here around York. And I can remember uh, four of us leaving, got us up at four o'clock in the morning because people were stranded between Waco and York. And uh, we left at four, got stranded out there, and two of the boys <clears throat> walked with blankets over their head, and, and they got within a mile or two of Waco. They found a little girl that was crippled in a car, and they, they hauled them, carried her to Waco in that terrible blizzard that you could hardly get your breath in, you know, and when you really don't have any business out there walking, but the boys were smart enough to carry uh, blankets with them, and as the wind sucked that breath away from them, they could keep themselves covered up so they could breathe and keep going. Only some of the snow had melted before the next storm hit around Christmas time. Then, on January 2nd, the storms began, giving no break for the snow to melt off the land before covering it with another blanket of several inches. The blizzard lasted for almost three days across Nebraska, and isolated people on farms and ranches, many who had sleighs used them to get to town. Some ranchers used the heavy snowfall to their advantage, hoping that it would lower the amount of livestock that could make it to the livestock auction in Chicago and raising the price of cattle. Winton Wright remembers a local cattle man hiring young men to scoop paths for the livestock through pastures to board the train. We went to church out northwest of town, the little church of Shiloh. I can remember going, they'd have bulldozers pushing, you know, uh, higher than cars, you know, you go through to just a tunnel. When I was a boy, we, the uh, neighbor south of us fed cattle, and uh, they hired young men to scoop the path for the cows, cattle to drive to Benedict to load on the train. They used scoop shells, all the young men around the community come and scoop snow. Mainly those cattle went to Chicago, to, and they thought they'd hit a good market by, you know, by storm wise. The last two weeks of January brought even more sub-zero temperatures, freezing rain, and piles of snow. Then, when people thought they were on the countdown to summer, another raging storm dropped 20 inches in March, and the snow kept coming. The last of the storms hit on April 14th in the south central and eastern part of Nebraska, bringing 12 inches far into what should have been spring weather. One record from Antelope County stated that they had drifts up to 30 feet that didn't melt till June. Although parts of the state had received over 100 inches of snow throughout the vicious winter, people refused to give in to the blinding storms and immobilizing drifts. Where they dropped hay out of airplanes to livestock that was stranded in, in pastures. <clears throat> Holly Miller was referring to the relief efforts by civilians and officials most commonly known as Operation Haylet, a specific program of the relief effort, Operation Snowbound. Dan Norris of Brewster, Nebraska, probably put Operation Haylet in proper perspective when he 
said, no doubt the operation did a great deal of good in its way. It was a temporary measure and kept cattle alive until they could be fed in a natural way. Operation Hayliff was so popular after the border subsided that producers even made a movie featuring several star actors of the time. Operation Snowbound was an effort by many groups such as the Fifth Army, the Red Cross, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Air Force, the National Guard, and the Civil Air Patrol. Through Operation Snowbound, relief workers teamed up to drop groceries, supplies, and hay to homesteads in need. The program was so effective that by the end of the blizzards, Operation Snowbound covered 193,193 square miles in four states. Saved more than four million cattle from starvation. Freed more than 243,000 snowbound people. Cleared more than 115,000 miles of road used 1,600 pieces of heavy equipment, and coordinated a 6,000-man workforce. The blizzards of 1948 and 1949 staggered the imagination. Nebraska, used to severe winters, was enveloped in what seemed to be an eternal winter that no one was prepared for. To this day, no Nebraska winter storm can match its intensity and effects. This blizzard of a century, perhaps a millennium, stands as the Katrina of the Plains. Although there was loss of life, livestock, and stranding of thousands of families, the ways in which people came together to overcome a common hardship and the acts of kindness shown reflect the true character of Nebraska citizens. The blizzards of 1948 and 1949 have their place in history books for years to come and are a pertinent and important part of our unique Nebraska identity. forest first began as an experiment. University of Nebraska botany professor Dr. Charles E. Bessie convinced President Theodore Roosevelt to set aside two treeless tracts of Nebraska sandhills as forest reserves. produce wood products, which would help to offset what some thought would be a national timber shortage due to large fires, unregulated harvests, and the country's growing appetite for wood products. The Charles E. Bessie Nursery was established in 1902 as part of the Dismal River Forest Reserve oldest seedling nursery managed by the USDA Forest Service. This nursery was used to create the world's largest man-made forest, or the Halsey National Forest. The 
nursery and range district were named in honor of Charles E. Bessie, a man who envisioned a forest growing in the wide open sand hills of Nebraska. The nursery is located about one mile west of Halsey, Nebraska, near the geographic center of the state. Charles E. Bessie Tree Nursery still produces 2.5 to 3 million seedlings per year for distribution to national forests, state forests, and tribal agencies in the Great Plains and West. never met Bessie's visions of becoming a timber producing forest, it is important for its wildlife, aesthetic, and recreational values, and as a living monument to that vision. Are there any questions? Uh oh. <laughs> Ooh, I do not know. My understanding is that was the worst. So how does the 1948-49 blizzard compare to 1899? 80, 80, 80. 80, 1980? I mean, 1880? I do not know. I don't know. That was the one they wanted to research was the 1940s. So I let them choose their topics, and, and they did their research. So anyone else? Um, regarding the... Cattle were shown, and there was this mooing sound. Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Samuel edited in the moos, and he kind of got a little exuberant about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the moo. Anyone else have any questions? I hope you enjoyed watching the films because my students really enjoyed putting them together, and you could you could tell they were student films, but that's what we wanted. We didn't want the teacher or the parent to do the work for them. Well, they got to learn something. They certainly did, and so did I, since I'm not from here, yeah. as you can probably hear with the southern twang. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time. It's been a wonderful experience. <laughs>